Good evening, everyone. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library, and I'm so it's so wonderful to have her. This is the first time that Not in Our Town, uh, Princeton's continuing conversations on race and white privilege has been back in the community room since 2019 or 2020. So it's really wonderful to have you all back here. Uh, thank you for coming in and joining us. This has historically been one of the favorite nights of everybody's year, so it's really a wonderful event to be starting back up. I want to just do a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Uh, the community room is T-Coil enabled, uh, so if you have a T-Coil enabled device, you can turn that on now. Alternately, we also have headsets on the piano, so if you'd like to try it out and see if this is something that would work for you, please feel welcome to take one of the headsets. The only way the system works is if everyone uses a mic, so if I'm coming up saying, please use the mic or angle the mic, it's because I want everybody to be able to hear it and for the program to be enjoyed by everybody. Um, it is my great pleasure to be standing here with Joyce Trotman Jordan, who is a member of Not Our Town Board, who is presenting the event this evening. And she's going to get us started. Thank you, niece. <laughs> Joyce. <laughs> Sorry. I got this. Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, not in our town, Princeton always begins the, our meetings with our land acknowledgement and our mission statement. The land on which we are living is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lene Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lene Lenape people past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in their homeland and in the diaspora. We also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs the wealth of this nation was created. Not in our town, Princeton is a multiracial, multi-faith group of individuals who stand together for racial justice and inclusive communities. Our focus is to, is to promote the equitable treatment of all and to uncover and confront white supremacy, the system that facilitates the preference, privilege, and power of white people at the expense of non-white people and pits racial and ethnic groups against each other by upholding the hierarchy based on proximity to whiteness. Our goal is to identify and expose the political, economic, and cultural systems which have enabled to create new structures and policies which will ensure equity and inclusion for all. In our commitment to uncovering the blight of white supremacy on our humanity, we take responsibility to address it and eliminate it in all its forms through intentional actions, starting with ourselves and our community. Thank you. And now, the high school people are going to do something with their programs. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it is such an honor uh, to be here and speaking for the first time, actually, with Not in Our Town. So it's my third or maybe fourth semester with Racial Literacy and Justice. Um, and this year, I had the privilege of teaching the course along with Christian Gonzalez and Scott Cameron, who are both in the English department, um, and Heather Harris and Patty Manhart, who you might know from last year. Um, they teach our other sections. Um, so we ran two in the fall and two in the spring this year. Um, so we had um, over 150 students engaging with these projects um, throughout the course of the year. And we have just a few here today to share all of their work and, and their inspiring um, sort of just thought processes with us today. Um, just to give you an overview of the course as it exists um, in our Princeton um, High School today, we have a study of several intersecting systems. Um, and one thing that we um, played with this year was pairing them together because they've always intersected and we've referred back to other units throughout the entire course. Um, and this year, especially as I brought on new co-teachers, we looked at politics, economics, and housing together, crime and punishment and education together, and aesthetics um, sort of on its own. 
Um, and that is where we saw most of our transfer projects actually, because it's something that kids um, tended to resonate with the most or have the most um, interpersonal sort of experiences with their abilities to transfer um, into their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so we sort of begin and end the course with a uh, survey of the invention of race historically and in the 21st century. And this year, especially since the course is growing year after year, um, and we've in, incorporated more underclassmen um, and diverse learners into our um, racial literacy and justice class. Not everyone has the U.S. history foundation um, that they had in the past. So we spent a little more time with invention of race to make sure everybody has sort of the same understanding of, um, you know, what race means in an American context. Um, and historically, what systems have been put in place to uphold systems of oppression. Um, and where we've seen progress as well. Uh, domination and progress is the constant balance. Um, a couple highlights from the year, we had in the fall, um, a symposium where students from both of the fall sections were able to share their projects with stakeholders in the school and one another. Um, it was in our PAC um, Performing Arts Center at the high school. Um, and these are just some samples of what students um, explored. We had so many students focus on sports this year. It was really interesting. And um, another one from the fall, one of my favorites was the study of, of Nike um, and sort of how they, they use black bodies to build white wealth. Um, and it was from a student who loved Nike. <laughs> so it was really interesting. Um, he is still buying Nike. He's still very loyal to the company, but he understands what he's doing. <laughs> um, so... It is, it's just really cool to see students take these areas that they already have interest in and uh, apply a racial literacy lens to um, reading them. Uh, in both the fall and the spring, in the fall, um, Dr. BJ was able to lead us um, in our, we, we follow loosely the um, Witherspoon Jackson Historical and Cultural Society's um, Heritage Tour, and I followed it when I had to lead it by myself in the spring, I followed it to the T. <laughs> I read off the signs. Um, but uh, it, it was really cool. And it's always a moment where students are really able to see that this is not just important to their study of history in high school and beyond, but to the way that they live and exist in their own community. Um, and to see those intersecting systems and just the neighborhood that they, you know, go and get their coffee in. So um, it's always a really eye-opening experience for students, and we're so privileged to be able to have the flexibility in our school system to you know, take an entire class of students out and just walk around the neighborhood with them for the day, um, but also to have students who keep an open mind, um, you know, as we engage in these sort of activities. Uh, without further ado, oh, actually, sorry, one more thing. Uh, so next week at the Princeton Public Library, US-1 classes are going to follow sort of a similar um, frame for understanding different episodes in US history, um, looking at hidden or lost or squandered perspectives in US history and highlighting them right here in this room. So it'll be next week on June 13th, it's a Tuesday night um, at 6 p.m. Uh, so they're very excited. <laughs> And uh, we actually have some students in the room here who have participated previously in, in our um, US-1 exhibits that are here at the um, Princeton Public Library. So if you're interested to see where outside of our racial literacy curriculum students are engaging with racial literacy, it's a cool opportunity to see sort of mainstream ed students um, engaging with similar questions and see how that plays out. Um, so Finally, I would like to start to invite some of our student presenters um, to share what they've learned this semester. And each student can introduce themselves when they come up, too. Hi. Um, my name is Luke. My pronouns are he, him. And uh, this is my uh, transfer product. Huh. Uh, so I decided to do uh, the history of black education uh, specifically at Princeton uh, because uh, we started the year in racial literacy learning about um, uh, different uh, topics uh, in terms of racial literacy and for some reason I'm blanking on them right now um, and how they affected back into our community and when we started our civil rights movement um, unit, I realized that there was no talk about what it was like in Princeton. Um, and that really fascinated me and I really wanted to learn more. So that's what this is about. 
<laughs> um, so uh, this is just kind of uh, a general overview in terms of history. Um, the abolishment of slavery in uh, 1865. This was uh, the, I think, Emancipation Proclamation of the 14th Amendment. 13th. <laughs> I knew that. Um, I was just you. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the 13th Amendment uh, freed uh, all uh, enslaved people. Um, but unfortunately, there was still a lot of uh, racism and inherent biases in our uh, society. Uh, a lot of uh, formerly enslaved people were unable to uh, get jobs because of racism and inequality in that uh, sense. And uh, many had to revert back to something called sharecropping, which was essentially legalized uh, in slavery, slavery uh, where an enslaved person was given a portion of uh, land uh, and they were uh, basically allowed to live on there, but they had to sell the, the produce that they uh, made off of it. But um, they were mostly trapped in this uh, cycle of debt because the people who own the land uh, wouldn't give them enough to profit off of, just enough to live off of it. And they were kind of stuck in this perpetual um, moment of the lack of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the Jim, uh, the Jim Crow uh, South was basically a set of laws that uh, legalized segregation in uh, housing and education and all sorts of things. And I focused specifically on uh, in education because that's what you see a lot here in um, Princeton. The Separate but Equal Act in 1869 decreed that uh, segregation in terms of education was legal and that uh, it was, you know, better for students, um, which obviously it wasn't. Um, it, caught, it created two separate schools, one institute where brown uh, students and students of color were taught and they received um, less educated teachers, they received less less money to go into their um, education and their, you know, materials that they needed to learn, uh, where white students received, you know, ample support. Uh, but then Brown v. Board of Education in uh, the 1950s, 1954 to be exact, uh, revoked the separate but equal clause and said that uh, segregation uh, in terms of education was unconstitutional and then started the long upheaval into desegregation, uh, desegregation of schools. So uh, segregation of Princeton, a lot of the uh, founders of Princeton owned slave. John Witherspoon, uh, he claimed to recognize the problem of slavery, but he never did anything to abolish it and actually owned slaves, which is incredibly hypocritical. Um, he was the, I think, sixth president of the university. Um, and then Samuel Stanhope Smith believed that race was created due to one's environment and that white and Anglo-American uh, people were superior to black and native people. Uh, he also believed that um, black and native people were, you know, just too wild and, and basically like, quote unquote violent and that they were incapable of uh, receiving education, which is why you know he didn't want any people of color attending his school. Um, and then as the Civil War began, uh, 74 out of 300 students attending Princeton went home. A majority of them went home just to feel safe, but a lot of them did end up joining um, the Confederate Army, which is not so great. Um, and the university only let white students graduate with degrees. They allowed um, some Asian American students to apply, but none of them received any degrees for a very long time. Uh, then after uh, World War II in the 1950s, segregation began at Princeton. Um, they started allowing and actively seeking out black applicants um, and they decided that they needed more uh, black students and black teachers and black members of their um, like board 
Um, the upsetting part was that uh, the campus itself was home to what's considered wasp culture and a lot of white supremacy. They perform, they have these things called uh, bickering, uh, where they would uh, perform these like social screenings, where they would kind of vibe check somebody, and it was in sense their turn to uh, like justify not letting uh, people of color and black students join their eating clubs. Um, but here's some highlighted students and some progress that we saw. Um, in 1947, John Leroy Howard was the first black student to receive an under, undergraduate degree. And then Joseph R. Moss, R. Moss followed in his footsteps and graduated in 1951. Linda Blackburn, uh, Terrell Nash, and Carla Wilson all graduated in 1971, and they were the first black women to receive undergraduate degrees. Uh, so in the 1960s, uh, Princeton students began to participate in the civil rights movement more. Um, in fact, uh, Martin Luther King hosted talks here in 1960 and 1962 um, as part of a campaign that I cannot remember the name of right now because, of course. Um, uh, but this just um, <laughs> created an upheaval of support for the civil rights movement. And um, a lot of Princeton students did participate uh, in the wash on Mar uh, the March on Washington, uh, as well as protested against the Mississippi governor, uh, Ross Barnett, although a handful of students did attend in support. So there was still um, change to be made. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, Princeton students were active in opposing apartheid, which was um, basically the continued legalization of segregation, specifically in South Africa. And many Princeton students um, held protests and uh, other forms of demonstrations to stop Princeton from continuing partnerships. And um, uh, I guess, I don't think trade is the right word, but I'm gonna use trade uh, with uh, companies that were operating out of South Africa. Uh, the Third World, which was the Third World Center, which was recently renamed to the Carl A. Field Center, uh, was a center for uh, students to just uh, come together as a community, both black and white students alike. Um, and Natalie uh, Byfield from the class of 81 shared that the Third World Center was a place to meet other students and to meet other students of color and um, she just got to know a lot of other people and they created a small community from there. Uh, so the 2000s into the present, uh, there were there's a lot of change that has been student led, um, including the addition of a Latino studies program in 2009, um, protests that were held for up to 40 years until finally in 2015, the addition of the Department of African Studies was created, and then an Asian American study certificate program was established in 2018. Um, and in 2020, a lot of protests were held on campus uh, for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and uh, Arbery. Uh, this is a picture of one of the protests, and these are my sources. Very good. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Yes, it is. Hi, my name is Ariana, and this is Kaylani. <laughs> I'm Kaylani here. Um, so, our project is on dance in America. Kailani is a part of the Princeton Youth Ballet, and I did Indian classical dance from ages 5 to 12. So we want to start with just um, the history of dance, and there have been many early historical records of dancing in different parts of the world, such as different um, Egyptian tombstones depicting dancing gods, and as well as Indian temples showing dancing people. And a lot of these dances are religious in nature, and they're similar to the forms of dance we see in present society. <laughs> um, so, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, different types of dance originate from 
um, different parts of the world. Ballet, um, as Kinani does, um, comes from Italian Renaissance courts of the 15th century, predominantly in white culture that was performed during noble events such as weddings and coronation ceremonies. Um, show to, for, to show your obedience to the king and queen of that moment. Um, hip hop came together in the Bronx borough of New York City in the 1970s and was highlighted most often in poor neighborhoods and predominantly in black dancers. Though today in the 21st century, we can see a lot more white and Latinx and a lot of other cultures performing in hip hop. Um, I did hip hop for a while. <laughs> Um, tap dancing is an indigenous American dance genre that evolved over a period of 300 years. Initially, it was a fusion of British and West African musical and step dance traditions in America. However, tap dance emerged in the southern United States in the 1700s, um, and that is what we know today more often as tap dance, um, with specific shoes that are correlated with the dance. And, Waltz, um, the original form of waltz was first used by the 13th century peasants in Germany. The form we know today was born in the suburbs of Vienna and Austria, some mountain regions. Predominantly white people are known to dance waltz during noble occasions such as weddings and as I said before, coronation ceremonies, um, which is a drastic change in difference from 13th century peasants to noble ceremonies. And lastly, we have tango and flamenco, which is not the same dance, <laughs> um, but they originate from parts of Argentina and show dancing as a street style dance, dance type. Although very romantic and noble, tango was actually popular among former yeah. slaves and working immigrants. However, tango was also adopted by Europeans and has adapted to the tango we familiarly know today. So these are some of our statistics. Um, and you can see in the graph um, that Asian dancers actually have the highest salary compared to other ethnicities, where um, Black and African American dancers have the lowest average salary at $49,000. And $11. Don't make a lot as a dance. Um, so here we have some a pie chart of dancer statistics by race. Um, the most common ethnicity among dancers is white, which makes up 43.9% of all dancers. Comparatively, there are 29.5% of, of Hispanic or Latino ethnicity and 107 of the unknown ethnicity. Um, the unknown, um, as I research, is often cultures or people who are mixed, sometimes white and Hispanic or white and Asian and black. So some examples of racism in dance, uh, we read an NBC News article of a black dancer calls out racism in elitist European ballet world. So it was about French national Chloe Lopez Gomez, um, who said she was mocked for her skin color and at times was pressured to wear white skin makeup. And there were also instances where she had to buy her own makeup for performances or felt driven to straighten her curly hair just to fit the certain standard that is typically associated with ballet. And she was told some of her mistakes stood out when she danced because she's black. And the company that she was a part of said it couldn't comment on personal matters, but took her complaints seriously. And an arts administrator in New York City said ballet was originally made by white people for white people for the amusement of royalty and aristocrats. Um, so this is all Kehlani here. She, uh, yesterday, she had a dance performance um, and she asked some of her friends, um, who were not exposed, <laughs> have, have you experienced racism within your dance education? And then as you can see, one said, not me personally, but I have seen others be exposed to racism, which has made me uncomfortable um, by a white female who is 16. And then the second drastic difference was a black female, 17, who said, yes, I have been exposed to racism, but they didn't know they were being racist. It's funny to see how people think they are complimenting me, but they actually weren't. So the background of this was that um, similar to the article about how she had to straighten her hair. She said someone complimented how her hair was curly while they were dancing and it so much wasn't a compliment as it was as it was supposed to be. Yeah. And so now we're gonna talk about racial fallacies. 
So a racial fallacy, um, it was like brought down into five different fallacies and they include the ahistorical fallacy, individualistic fallacy, legalistic, tokenistic, and the fixed fallacy. So an ahistorical fallacy um, renders historical racism as relevant in today's problems. Individualistic fallacy is the idea that racism is only to be a thing that racist people are capable of. Legalistic fallacy is something that functions on the belief that the writing of explicitly racist laws will eliminate racism itself, which is similar to like de jure and de facto. Tokenistic fallacy is the belief that the success of a few people of color, such as Obama or Rihanna or Oprah, it, um, proves that the racial obstacles don't exist. And a fixed fallacy is the belief that racism cannot be fixed and that it is the fixed and that it is fixed between space and time. Um, but how does this apply to dance in America? So um, there are a few very popular African American dancers, ballet dancers, Misty Copeland, who um, kind of appeal to like the tokenistic belief, where um, just because they have made it in the industry, they're working, they have like they have the money to prove that they have made made it somewhere. Um, showcase the like idea that just because she made it doesn't mean that. Um, everyone else will make it, or everyone else doesn't face the same obstacles that she did. Just because she made it doesn't erase all of the hard work that she's put into getting there, or the obstacles she's faced. So um, the other um, idea was ahistorical. As I talked before about, or as Kailani talked before about, how dancing comes from a long period of like being on cave walls or coming from like Egyptian tombstones. Um, just because that racism was still there but in centuries BCE. <laughs> oh, sorry, BCE. <laughs> um, it still, it doesn't render today, but it's still here today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Manny, and my project will be on race in film throughout history. Art. The product of passionate hatred and love from yours truly, the human race. The ideal tool for expression of our ideas, opinions, messages, and our views on the world as a whole. Possibly our most expressive branch of art, film, has been home to some, remote, to some of our most accessible yet controversial pieces of media. These controversies mostly stirring around religion, violence, possibly things going on behind the camera, and the absence or the presence of representation. Representation being the inclusion of women, the LGBTQIA+, and of course, the main focus of my project, racial minorities. As we look around at our films today, it is very unlikely we see the absence of inclusivity. This is mostly due to our progression as a society as a whole. From drastic things such as the abolishment of slavery and the Jim Crow laws, the civil rights movement, and many, many more examples. Art being a product of society has of course bloomed and progressed as much as our leaders and laws in some aspects. So let's just see how much we have progressed. The year is 1915. Slavery had been abolished by now, yet black people were still seen in the same valley they had been when they were shackled, whipped, bought, and sold over 50 years ago. Not only was America in its most segregated state with its Jim Crow laws, lynchings were at a peak that will have never been met again. Among all of the other cruel acts committed by those seen as higher members of society, The Birth of a Nation is controversially produced by Hollywood. The film takes place during and after the Civil War, uh, soon following into the Reconstruction Era, 
and is about the relationship of a Union family and a Confederate family during these times. The film receives most of its backlash through the heroic, brave, and savior-like depiction of the white supremacist group, the KKK, and the criminal and savage-like depiction of black people. The Klansmen are depicted as these heroes of America due to their detestation towards the horrible error of giving black people rights. Black people being depicted as lustful and mindless, the film would go on to be a massive success, garnering over 5 million viewers. The KKK capitalized on the success of the movie, while many stereotypes were popularized for black people. The NAACP would go on to try and fail to boycott the movie. Fast forward a couple of decades to the year 1934. America is still in its segregation era when the movie Gone with the Wind is released. This movie focuses on and victimizes the Confederacy and shows just how many hardships they went through during the Civil War. Our main character, Scarlett O'Hara, is widowed due to her husband being killed in the war and eventually loses her house when it is burned down by the Union. How dare the evil Union fight for basic human rights? <laughs> Skipping past history by three decades, we find ourselves in the year 1968. America had been in its years of turmoil and change. We were also just seeing the end of the civil rights movement with the assassination of Martin Luther King, and just three years prior, the Voting Rights Act. And as the laws changed, standards did too. And with that, movies would be changed forever. With the inclusion of zombies. <laughs> George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead would present for the first time in history, The Walking Dead, man-eating, plague-bringing monsters. Not only was it a fictional marvel for film and the future of it forever, it was also one of the first instances of a black hero that wasn't offensive or demeaning to anyone. Ben, played by an actual black person. <laughs> Dwayne Jones. In contrast to the white savior complex seen in a lot of the movies prior and future to Night of the Living Dead, for once a black man would be the one heroically rescuing white people. Or at least try to. The film would take place in a house surrounded by zombies while characters desperately try to survive. Throughout the movie, it is shown that some of the white characters who inhabit the house detest the, the idea of a, man, of a black man being in control, questioning and defying his leadership. This theme of racism would continue until the end of the film, where Ben is the only character to survive the house massacre, just to be shot by a white man, mistaking him for a zombie. Commenting on just how society block, just commenting on just how society saw black people, violent plague bringing monsters. The film would go on to release with many controversies, mostly surrounding its excessive violence and, of course, the African American protagonist. Now, fast forwarding to 2017 for our last stop, police brutality in America is not on course to stop anytime soon. Donald Trump is inaugurated. The Unite the Right rally takes place in Charlottesville. And that just a dip in the pool of the situation America was in. In the midst of all of this, we would see the, the debut of one of the most talented modern horror directors, Jordan Peele. With his movie commenting on the treatment of black people during the time being, Get Out. The movie would focus on Chris visiting his girlfriend's family yep. estate. Prior to going to the house, Chris's friend voices his concerns about a black man going up to the secluded woods with an all white family who are also accompanied by a black housemaid and a black gardener. Things would eventually go wrong when near the end of the movie, it is revealed that Chris is only invited to be used as a vessel for the white family and those associated, which is really complicated and too much to get into. <laughs> in the deleted ending of the movie, Chris would kill the entire family in his attempt to escape and eventually get arrested. The movie uses the history of racism to not only deliver a thought-provoking story, but also a terrifying one too. Get Out would go on to win an Oscar for Best Screenplay, and Jordan Peele would continue to create more predominantly black-lit movies. During the segregation era, black people and those who worked towards achieving more equality were depicted as evildoers and morally incorrect. Even after the segregation era was over, black people would still face discrimination, this possibly due to a poor representation of them in media that surrounded society. The filmmakers of Hollywood would then attempt to paint them in a better light, which came with its ups and downs. Now that we are in present day, 
we see a lot better representation and messages of black people and their stories. Not only has it become a lot more normalized than it was in the early 1900s to see black people as these inspirations, but as well as just your average person. We might have taken some steps back, but no matter what, we'll keep moving. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. So mine's going to be a little shorter, but um, <clears throat> my name is Sarah, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a junior at Princeton High, Princeton High School. So today I'll be talking about employment discrimination. So um, my definition of employment discrimination is the illegal discrimination in the workplace on the base of race, sex, sexual orientation, etc. And in this presentation, I'll be talking about um, race specifically. And I separated employment discrimination into two subsections, direct and indirect. And di direct would be like the use of like racial slurs or like negative racial uh, rhetoric um, in the workplace. And also like different, different treatment directly sta uh, stated to be like related to a per an employee's uh, or employer's race. Um, and also the failure to hire or promote on the basis of race. And indirect would be more so like, for example, like not viewing like someone's natural hair as like professional or like non-direct favorable or unfavorable treatment on the basis of race. Um, and in terms of legality, employment discrimination is illegal in the United States. And I believe it was made so after the uh, Civil Rights Act. Um, but this does not mean that it like, does not occur today. It occurs like both in its direct and indirect forms but it is more often that it will occur through like a more like indirect means. Um, and it is possible to take an issue of like employment discrimination to court. And there are specific lawyers who will um, like help people like in the case like that they're being discriminated against based off like race or any other um, uh, factor. Um, and I believe that employment discrimination comes from bias, and I also separated this into two subsections, external bias and internal bias. And external bias is direct, causes direct racism in the workplace. An example would be like racist employees and employers that intentionally work to uh, discriminate on the basis of race. And internal bias, which I believe is more common and more like hard to detect, um, is like indirect and implicit biases that negatively affect um, racial minorities, despite like the uh, lack of intent to do so. And this comes from a lot of like social socialization and just like internalized um, like biases. Um, and in terms of statistics, uh, black people report 60% higher rates of workplace discrimination in comparison to white people. And older wage-employed Black people and women report the highest rates of workplace discrimination. So um, to conclude, if um, it is important that if um, you see like an example of employment discrimination to know that it is illegal and you can take it to court and it should be important to like, gather evidence and um, like fight against it because it is possible. And um, it's also important that if you're an employer or an employee to like look into like see if you have or if you see any examples of implicit biases or like look into your own like perhaps you may have like implicit biases and like despite like not having racist intent um there may be you may like indirectly perpetuate um like racist systems in employment and in the workplace Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, my name is Tayer, and I'm a freshman in Princeton High School. So uh, my presentation is about race and social media. 
And um, I chose to like basically focus on three main things. First of all, the algorithms, which is how we as the user view race in social media, um, how the creators are fighting against it and uh, against racism, and then also how um, brand pay and all the like, how um, there's the racial wealth gap, what's more uh, pay gap in uh, in influencer creators uh, also. So um, as an introduction, like social media is a platform that I think like everyone here uses, especially in my generation. I think that a lot of where we get our politics or whatever comes from social media. And so the way race is viewed there is um, very important because it affects how we um, view the world. And so first of all, um, the way the algorithms do social media. So um, this um, black creator did this experiment where he tried to put certain um, phrases inside his videos and it flagged um, terms such as Black Lives Matter as hate speech while well, he put things like white supremacy um, and they didn't flag it at all. So um, this caused some backlash and the main reason for this is the way um, social media companies use uh, like to detect to detect hate, hate speech. So they use mainly AI which is basically inputted from human data so because human data is biased and racist, it's causing the machine to be biased as well. And um, next is the black TikTok strike, which happened I think a couple of years ago, in which black creators were basically upset with the way their content was being stolen and their dances were being stolen by white creators who were going viral and getting all the credit. And so they basically went on a strike, which and they, st they still kept on creating content, but it was content um, directed at the strike. And um, an example for this will be Addison Rae, who is like a white creator who danced like Black Me Dances on The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon. And there was zero credit to the OG creators who were black. And it's basically a form of cultural misappropriation of black art by the white social media creators. And so I guess this is a bit of an explanation, but what, how most influencers get their money is from brands paying them for shooting like promotions for them and like ads. And so um, a lot of the, a lot of brands will pay differently for white and black influencers. There's a 35% pay gap between black and white creators. And so this basically creates this way of black creators not being able to grow or work as a contest or full-time job, which leads to less black creators on the platform, which leads to less representation. And um, here's some statistics. So there's a lot less uh, black creators who reach the, the macro influencer tier. And the, a lot of them see that they struggle with the pay process and knowing how much to ask for it. And as we can see, there's a massive gap between how black creators and white creators are affected when they talk about race. It's a lot of black creators saying that they're affected negatively with the worst um, followers if they talk about race on their platforms. And so a major factor for this would be pay transparency. So um, basically social media platforms, uh, social media brands don't really need to pay um, the creators an equal amount. They pay it individually based on the followers and whatever. So it's very hard to know what to expect for a brand to pay. And so you, they're negotiating a deal is very difficult. And so basically the, this causes like the big racial pay gap and there's no professional help to how to do this process. And so there's basically the main steps for improvement would be to have pay transparency, to be clear how much they're supposed to be paid for each thing. And um, an example for this would be this Instagram account called the Influencer Pay Gap which gives examples of influencers who send them how much they get paid for certain things so that they people know what to ask for. And um, leveling the playing field and bridging opportunity gap, basically so um, so black creators can have more of a space to go. And then also changing the algorithms, such as example with the flagging hate speech and whatever. And lastly, we, the audience of social media, can have the power of choosing what we want to see and engage in and who are we following and what are we choosing to watch. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Hello, I'm Adele. I am a current sophomore and rising junior at Pia and Princeton, Princeton High School. Um, I'm also doing media, so that's fun. Mm -hmm. um, this is I made an Instagram account, basically. Um, my main goal in this whole project was to reach out to my rising um, adults who are going to be adults, uh, young adults who are going to be adults. Um, I, my main target was actually my sister, and I got the idea because she's always on Instagram, and the only way to get information out to my generation is unfortunately through media. Um, because we get all of our information, not from the news, not from newspapers, but from Instagram itself, which is kind of sad. But uh, I, I chose to educate about media with media. So this is my Instagram page. It's not much, but it gets the point across. Um, my first couple posts that I did, um, they mainly focus on how race is involved in media. Uh, my first post was, who's running media? Because that's the main question that we have to established before we talk about anything else. Um, if you weren't already surprised, it's white people, um, pretty much. Um, the statistic on the bottom uh, right shows that it's kind of hard to see, so I put it. Um, more than 80% of the employers and employees of basically generalized average media companies are white people. So that's a problem. Um, so basically how this works is that if you don't have representation in the head companies and all like people who are doing everything and it trickles down, you're not going to get representation in the information you're seeing. So that's an issue. Um, so I kind of split it off into two branches. Um, my first branch was devaluing black creators directly, and then my second branch was roles in media specifically. So my first um, kind of part of my first branch was digital blackface, which is a scary word, yes I know. Um, I actually didn't know what this was before I researched it. Um, it basically describes the act of producing, posting, or circulating black reaction GIFs, which are like moving images, um, online and especially in social media threads. Which, um, to kind of simplify that, it's taking the work that a black creator does, reacting, adding to any post, and using that without crediting, which is very problematic. Um, this basically devalues any work that they're doing while crediting the usually white or non-black people in the same kind of line. Um, it's becoming more of a looked, overlooked because no one really knows about it, um, which becomes more harmful. Um, and especially, specifically um, when black people see that their stuff is getting credited, but not to them, it's hurting them on the inside. Like it's mentally draining and it's horrible, um, but they don't say, get the same recognition for the work that they're doing on their own. Uh, my second branch, was black fishing. I think this is a more commonly known one. Um, technically speaking, it's uh, behavior by white entertainers who appear to be in, imitating the appearance of black people. Um, but like a more simplified version is taking the black aesthetic and applying it to get more followers. So this is usually when white people take the qualities, traits, anything to do with the culture and traditions, and they use it to gain like following and basically an empire on social media. Um, basically, it's you're getting more fame while decrediting and completely ignoring the actual OG black creators. Um, it's horrible because the black creators are getting hated on for their own qualities, own traits, while these other white, usually non-white, usually um, people are getting, um, you know, uh, they're being desired, they're being um, congratulated. So it also comes in forms of um, representation and lack of representation. So when you have um, a lot of whitewashing going on, you're not gonna find um, companies that include and are inclusive or diverse, uh, specifically in makeup brands. So you'll see a lot of foundation shades that are not deep enough um, for darker skin tones, um, which again is trying to wash out um, black people gen in general um, while keeping it white. <coughs> Uh, my second branch was roles in media, um, more specifically recognizing the racial biases. Um, what a culture to create portrayed through the white perspective, like in film, when you have directors that are mostly white, they're going to show it in a white way. They're not going to show it um, originally, they're not going to show it um, authentically, um, and it's going to um, take the media that you're making and devalue it. Um, mostly in film, uh, it reflects the culture and society 
um, but it also contributes to society, society's values and beliefs. So when consumers are consuming, are consumer, are um, taking in this film that is not authentic, you're going to apply that to your own self and your own self biases. Um, so yeah, spreading of misinformation um, also adds to conser- consumers' own beliefs, which just adds to the snowball of hate. Uh, my second second branch was uh, the need for representation. So this whole kind of project was about we need representation everywhere, not just in small communities. We need it globally. Um, one example was um, in Jesse. It's like a 2000, right? Yeah, something like that. it's a 2000 show about like a nanny and she has to care, take care of like these four kids. And Rob is one of the characters, and he is the stereotypical, stereotypical um, Indian American kid who is like the nerd and everything. And it's was pretty not really controversial back then because it's kind of the norm. But now it's like, okay, we need to talk about this because that was not okay. Um, and many American, Asian Americans, um, stereotypical roles, um, specifically to the Indian background, um, are interacting, are, are greatly affected. Um, mostly in like, you get those, um, the Asian kid who's like very smart and is great at math. And that's just, we don't need that. We don't need that. And the representation is pretty much wrong. It's representation, but it's the wrong kind of representation. <clears throat> Um, so minorities want to have representation, but in not like a grand gesture kind of thing. They want just to be there, be on screen, to be shown appropriately and respectfully. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, we have a student who wasn't able to make it today, um, last minute, but hopefully we'll be able to share some of his work later this week um, when we share in class. Um, But we wanted to designate um, the last bit of time that we had for Q&A with not only our students, but also with um, teachers of the racial literacy course um, and how it's implemented at the high school. Um, So I don't know if it's possible to, I know with with the microphone, it might be difficult to question. We can pass one around. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so if anybody has questions for any of our student presenters um, or for us faculty at, at Princeton High School, we'd be happy to answer. Does anyone have any questions? I guess I'd just like to ask Adele. Um, you know, the challenge is, or from what I heard in your presentation, there's a problem with white directors or creators, um, including characters of color. Um, But it seems like you also want to have the representation that you were talking about in the last segment. So I'm curious if you have any suggestions about how to, you know, to be inclusive, but to do it in the right way. Um, how to cure representation. Okay. Um, that's a difficult question only because there's so many layers to it. Um, it's kind of hard. Oh, it works. Okay, go. Um, it's kind of hard to like simplify it down to just like one thing we can check off. I think it's because it's so rooted in like society with like just day to day stuff. It's going to take a while. Um, I think one thing to do is, again, with the opportunities, that starts from like education um, and being able to become a director itself and to be in control of the media, since a lot of um, stuff starts from the community itself. So because there's 80% that says something, there says something that the white, um, that we people are getting more opportunities to become people that are in charge. Um, so once we get people in charge, we can start changing some media. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a great question. I don't really know how to answer it, but it's, it's, it's hard. I think this course specifically is really good about it. Um, it is a requirement, but I took it because I wanted to learn more. I took media studies in freshman year and I loved it, but I also was kind of disgusted about how many directors were just not doing it right. Um, but yeah, I think this course is a good step because then people like myself can learn more about how to be um, more socially aware and how to make more opportunities if we ever become in power. Because I am a white female, I have probably more opportunities than anybody else, or a white man. Right? But um, <laughs> I don't want to say that. Um, but by taking this course and by being surrounded by people that are 
progressively working towards awareness, um, I can become and I can give off my power. So I can get it myself and I can share it as well to people who don't have a voice, who don't have the opportunity. So I guess, I don't know if that answers the question, but <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, this is really um, some information, some storytelling for Luke. Um, okay. Please share. Um, so Luke is in the other section. I've actually never had Luke as a student, sadly. I was very impressed by that presentation. But what is the question I might be able to help? Oh, it's information, it's storytelling. Oh. So the African-American students that were at Princeton University during the 70s would oftentimes come down to the um, Jackson Witherspoon Street area, and they would either have Sometimes some housing. My auntie that lived on Don Street would often have uh, students staying at her house. And my brother who lived down on Birch Avenue would often invite the students down to his house for family dinners. So within the African-American community in Princeton, uh, that section of town also embraced all of the students there. So if you see Luke, make sure you let him know. Absolutely, okay. and that's read that's that's storytelling, and, and Aunt Shirley was toy. here, she would tell you too. <laughs> so, check in with Aunt Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. You're welcome. Uh, two questions one for the students, and then one for the teachers. Uh, first of all. Thank you so much. I am just incredibly impressed with the effort of research, the cohesiveness of your presentations, what you've clearly learned and be able to convey. It's terrific. It's really very heartening. And what I'd like to ask is, if you think back to your beginning of that course, of this course, um, in addition to the actual knowledge that you gained, can you talk a little bit about the impact it had on you? Do you see things differently than you did before you took the course and in what ways? Okay, I'm here <laughs> Um, I would say I was um, already pretty well versed on racial literacy. Um, I think one thing that really stood out to me was um, when I'm having conversations with people that are not aware of it or are not um, personally like exposed to more um, progressive ideas, I'm, I have the strategies to talk to them. I have also the um, the tools, the labels, I guess, like what they're trying, how they're coming off. Like the fallacies, I did not know about that um, until I was like listening to it, and I was like, okay, that makes sense. I know what that is now, and then it makes it easier for me to help and like support them and try and get them to learn more about it. So it's not—I don't know if it's me personally, but it helped me um, get to other people. I guess. I think especially like when we're, I looked at other things, like you know, books I read or shows I watch, I could see it and sort of like racial lens, see how like the people of color are being presented and how it's being, you know, maybe stereotypical, maybe it's being like accurate representation and see how basically it affects like even like in a way that I wasn't aware of, that wasn't directly, I saw it as like, you know, as racist. That's only I can see it and, you know, observe it. Do you like to respond? No pressure. Or just... <laughs> um, similar to what you said, uh, yeah, after taking the course, I was definitely a lot more open-minded when it comes to one of my biggest interests, film and TV and all that. Um, and, you know, mentioned earlier, you know, when there's the wrong people behind the cameras directing how certain minorities act, such as, uh, I'm not exactly sure what his name was, but that one character in uh, Jesse the so much earlier, and how uh, 
uh, an Indian kid was, you know, offensively um, represented, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an issue. And I'm starting to see that issue become less and less and less with, you know, the, the movies I'm seeing now. Like, um, uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, mention one movie that came out recently, uh, a new Spider-Man movie, Across the Spider-Verse, that has fantastic representation, especially when it comes to the uh, Indian culture. And it's really, really cool to see that after taking a course like this, because it really shows you know, how far we've come. And it's really, really cool to see. Thank you. Do you want to say that? Okay, great. Do we have any other questions, either for a teacher? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you say no, you're saying yes. <laughs> yeah, so before like, I start the course, um, I knew like, much of like the history because I'm very like interested in history. But what I learned was especially like how um, the stuff we learned like related to like our own town of like Princeton. Because I never like before that taking the course, I didn't really know about like the history of racism in Princeton. Um, and learning about it, and also there's this one lesson where we learned about like racism specifically in the high school, and it was very recent from about like 2016, and it really like opened my eyes to see like these like big historical issues were like very close to home, and they were pretty much like everywhere even in this town. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my second question to the teachers. Well, the racial literacy and justice course is not African American history, but there is now a curriculum for AP African American history. And it's been announced that it will be in 26 schools in New Jersey. And I've been dying to find out if it's going to be at Princeton High School. <sighs> um, I have not heard of plans of that yet. Um, we have, uh, we have an AP committee at the high school, and so a lot of our conversations about wellness are centered on how many AP classes students can take and how many will be offered. And um, it was recently limited to students are no longer able to take more than one history AP per year. Um, so we're trying to sort of pivot and figure out how we can keep our enrollment up when we aren't able to offer. Because a lot of times we would have students who take, you know, AP Euro, AP Human Geography, AP World, and they're all very separate courses, but now it's being restricted. Um, so I'm not sure if there are plans in the future um, to bring that AP course in or if there are plans to keep any AP courses at all. Um, so it's it's been a conversation that's been going on as long as I've been there, but I haven't heard of plans to bring the AP African Studies course. We are introducing a new AP History course next year, AP Human Geography. Um, yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Very simple question. I heard that this uh, the racial literacy and culture of the course is now required. And yeah. in what sense? That every student starting when has to take it? Or we have a Princeton Introduction to Racial Literacy course, which will be required for um, graduating students and the elective can count as well. Um, do you know what year? I think it's uh, my year. It's starting my year. So okay, so junior, in your arising junior. Arising junior, so 25. Okay. So I don't understand exactly what you said. So can you exactly <laughs> explain? So there's a separate course yeah. called Introduction. It's a, yeah, so as of right now, it's online, but you know we're looking at all of the different ways that it can exist within the school. Um, and that will be the requirement. And then the racial literacy elective that these students have taken goes um, into the history and the systems. And will that be a semester course also? Yeah, it is now, oh, yeah. The Introduction. The, oh, no, the introduction course right now exists online. Um, what does that mean? It's online. I mean, it's self directed, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not required. I, no, that is so, I'm sorry. Oh, you're, you're graduating in 2025. So starting with the class of 20, starting with the class of 2025, it's required. Yes. So we have to take it. Um, this. 
this class build a requirement? It does, yeah. yeah. So you yeah. can either do this class, which is the semester in person, or you can do the summer program, which is online. So you can do it um, with your house, you can do it on vacation. Okay. And it's like self directed. Yeah. So you don't really have a person, you just kind of go through like the modules and the slides. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it may not, it may become a in person course or it'll stay an online course? We don't know now. Yeah, it's it's new. The the Pearl, the Princeton Introduction to Racial Literacy is online. So yeah. But I think mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's really important to recognize the moment that Pearl was necessary. Mm -hmm. So the Princeton Introduction to Racial Literacy course was born out of a historical moment in mm -hmm. 2020. Oh yeah. And as a community, we were reeling from the egregious racial harm, racialized harms that were happening locally as well as nationally. Down the street in Lawrence, um, up, up the street in Newark. If you go back and, and check the Star Ledger from 2019, 2020, you would be horrified if you didn't know how much trauma was being suffered by black children, by Jewish children, by indigenous children, by Latinx children. And then if you couple that with their gender <coughs> lives or their impoverished lives, it was difficult. So Pearl, was born out of that, but it was very intentional to draw attention to the very many ways that our society is racialized. It's three years later and the curriculum must change um, and the people are changing. And what's really nice to see is that there's so many beautiful layers like I love hearing about Sarah's presentation of employment and wage gaps. I love hearing about the walking dead, <laughs> which honestly, when you think about it, at the same time that black exploitation films were emerging as a voice, this was happening and it's revolutionary because most horror films never featured people of color, uh, which is crazy that people want to be killed and bloody on screen. But the idea of the zombie, I think, is also um, wildly symbolic of how we are living now. I appreciate every single transfer product. And for those of you who've never understood what that means, the children themselves are taking in all of these things, nuanced and in very complicated ways. And then they are digesting it, consuming it, and redistributing that information. So that's the transfer. And so everything that you all have shared today, whether it was about the crazy algorithmic nature of social media and the role that mainstream and social media play in how we think about race, I think there is much to celebrate uh, about the ways that we are memorializing the need to address our very problematic past and present mm -hmm. with race and racialized harm. Um, and so I wanted to just stop and say thank you to Katie and thank you to Not In Our Town who have you all have always been highly supportive of the work that we do in our school to transform the way all of our students think about how they will be change agents because we really must deal with this in um, really important ways in a community that really only has 5% of its student population identify as black. So this is a non-black issue, but we have to help everyone see the harm that holding on to racial thought and racialized thought does.
Does anyone else have a question they want to ask or show hand and like to show you? Last chance. Going <laughs> once, going twice. Okay, I'm Shelly Krause. I'm one of the members of the board of Not In Our Town, Princeton. Um, I want to add my voice to the chorus of thanks. Um, thanks to the teachers, Scott Cameron, Kate, Katie Deneen, Christian Gonzalez, Heather Harris, and Patty Manhart. Um, thanks, Dr. Joy B. <laughs> for starting us all. Um, thanks to the students tonight, Luke, Adriana and Kailani, Manny, Sarah, Ter, Adele. I, I always feel after this program like I literally need to build an extension for my brain. <laughs> because this is a lot of very deep and powerful learning mm -hmm. um, and it bears reflection and I think the students did such a wonderful job of distilling mm -hmm. and, um, and integrating a long history in, in many instances and uh, it's just really inspiring and encouraging so thank you again for, for taking the time to be with us here tonight. A um, couple of housekeeping notes going forward. In July, Not In Our Town Princeton will participate once again in a community-wide shared reading of and reflection on Frederick Douglass's iconic address entitled, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July? Uh, this again is a text that bears revisiting. So even if you've done this before, you're gonna wanna do it again. And if you haven't, you really need to do it. Community members will read an amended version of Douglas's influential speech, which was initially given on July 5th in 1852 in Rochester, New York, uh, to the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, so the event is going to take place on the uh, anniversary, on July 5th, which is a Wednesday. So that will take the place of our usual Monday evening program that month. So Wednesday, July 5th, uh, taking place on Zoom, and you can get the information and registration through our excellent partners here at the Princeton Public Library. The following month, August, we're talking about August, we will return to Monday and also return to in-person, although we will continue to have virtual options. Uh, on Monday, August 7th, Not In Our Town Princeton will be learning alongside Amy Torres, who will be focusing on racial disparities in the treatment of immigrants. Very powerful, again, powerful learning opportunity. Um, and once again, that will be in person here with virtual options. So uh, thanks again to everybody who came out tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, we hope to see you again next year. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I was like, what's <laughs> 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 <laughs>